Thank you, Dr. Childers, for that gracious and kind and introduction, which I think my mother must have had a hand in writing, actually. Uh, thank you for that. I, there, before I start, I, I do, I do want to thank uh, not only Dr. Childers, who is a, a great colleague and friend, and, and, and truthfully, everybody in the world should have a colleague like Jeff Childers. The world would be a much better place. Uh, I think that's called utopia, probably. Um, but I also want to thank our panelists who come to join us tonight, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get to meet them in just a few minutes. But thank you for the, the work you've done in reading the book and having good questions, I'm sure, and uh, the conversation that we're going to have. I'll just thank you in advance for that. And I, I thank my own family, and especially my wife, Sam Jung, who is here tonight, and uh, who has been with this book for a long time and is in its many iterations and has probably paid more of a price for it than she should have had to pay. But I, I'm grateful to you too for being here. And to all of you, uh, welcome and thank you for coming. I know you had other things to do tonight, but I'm grateful that you cho chose bread over circuses. And, <laughs> and so I, I thank you, thank you for that. There is actually one copy of the book that has escaped the warehouse and it is in my hand. Uh, so it does exist, it is real, and uh, will be shipped soon to those who want to buy it for a remarkably low price. Uh, and I hope you will, and more than that, I hope that it will be of some use to someone. W.H. Uh, Auden once said years ago that authors write in order to be read. And I think though that's obvious, it's also a very powerful thing because you ask yourself who might read what I have to say uh, and who might uh, engage it negatively or positively. And my prayer is that someone out there will read it and find it meaningful and will find it life honoring and life giving. You know, somewhere at this very moment, a family is being broken apart as one of, as a parent is being deported. Somewhere today, another family is taking the first steps to leave the country of its origin and head to another one in order to escape war or famine or disease. Somewhere today, Men and women are deciding whether they will be of service to those who are on the move or not. Somewhere today, churches are welcoming strangers, or else they are not. To those who are engaged as hosts of strangers, or those who are strangers themselves, who are on the move, or have recently been on the move, I'd like to dedicate this hour so that we're together. Because in truth, what we do as Christians is to a large degree for those people. It's not just that much of the church is itself a group of migrants and always has been, but that those of us who are at home, as I am, though I do joke about doing mission work in Texas and have done that for nearly 20 years. I'm from Arkansas, so I'm from a foreign country. Uh, as much as we might joke about that, those of us who are at home have great privileges and therefore great responsibilities and opportunities to show the love of Christ to others. And so it's in that context that I, I started thinking about this book. You know, the truth is, in our world today, something like 250 million people live in a country other than the one in which they were born. And in addition to those, and they, they move voluntarily more or less, though voluntarily is always a, a dicey concept. Uh, in addition to those, something like 60 million people are, have been forced to leave their home they are either internally displaced persons living in the same, terror, the same country in which they were born, but in a, not, in a place that's not really theirs, or they have left that country and moved mostly to nearby countries, uh, mostly from one poor, fragile country to another poor, fragile country. 
And so the scale of that phenomenon, 300 plus million people, several interlocking phenomena, is itself significant. I would say one of the most significant moral, political, social challenges in the world today. Uh, it's an important challenge for the church as well because a large percentage, nobody knows except God how many, are themselves Christians. And even if they're not Christians, they are fellow human beings. And so our responsibilities are there. Well, we all know that the numbers keep moving. Unfortunately, they keep moving up in that latter category because the world that seems so stable turns out not to be really that. Uh, but it's also the case that, especially in the developed world in the last few years, the scale of migration and the reality of migration have challenged the political structures of those of us who live in the wealthy countries of the world. We, of course, Americans live in the wealthiest country in human history. Uh, and so, it, but it has challenged us too. And in the political arena, we see people who exploit the fears of others uh, for their own political gain. And so there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of indiscriminate prejudice headed in lots of different directions. And so for me as a Christian, and I, let me speak autobiographically for a very brief moment, because I don't really like to do that. But for me as a Christian, it's not just this large global issue that I want to think about. It's, it's also the church's response to that issue. And in many cases, the church's non-response, the deafening silence of Christians to this issue. And oftentimes the acquiescence, the acceptance of oppression and injustice by Christians. And even sometimes our direct involvement in it, the misuse of the Bible to justify it. Well, I wanna say when I hear people do bad exegesis, it makes me mad, but it's way more than that. Because I, if I got mad every time I had bad exegesis, I'd just have to have a heart transplant every, about every other week. So, so it's not that. It's bad exegesis that hurts people. That's, that's the challenge. That enables us to ignore what Jesus thought was the primary command to love God and then the secondary one to love our neighbor as ourselves. He never said, love your neighbor as yourself unless he or she is undocumented. And so that's part of why I wrote the book. I was frustrated, I was angry, but more than anger, it's not just anger, it's, it's a, a, what I hope is a righteous indignation. And also a sense of responsibility. If I should ever be blessed with grandchildren, there's a good chance they might ask me what I did in this moment in time. And even if I never am, or even if they never do, as a Christian, I believe that someday I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or evil. And so that reality uh, causes me to work. You ask yourself when there are these big issues floating around, what can I do? Because some of them are huge and the truth is it's hard to know what to do. One thing I thought I could do is I could work on a book because that's what scholars do. Uh, and so that's why this book came about. Of the, of the several I've written or edited over the years, I think this is the one, at least for now, that has the, uh, the most of my heart in it. Uh, because the truth is only a few very enlightened people care about ancient Israelite kingship. They will all go to heaven, of course, but, but uh, not very many people care about that. 
I think a lot of millions of people, millions of people care about this one and they have something at stake in it. I'm also the elder in the church, as Jeff said, and in our congregation, as in probably every congregation of which you are a part, I hope, uh, there are migrants. Some have documents in order and some don't. And in many cases, families have members who are citizens, other members who are undocumented, children who are DACA children, children who are citizens, all living under the same roof. If your church doesn't, that may mean that it's taken steps to make sure it excludes them unintentionally or maybe intentionally. So that's the need of the book. There, there's some issues to steer around. I don't think you can move straight from pulling Bible verses out to public policy. There's a circuitous route. And I'm not trying to do that. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an immigration expert. Uh, but behind law, behind the policy that comes from law, behind the actions that come from policy, behind and surrounding all of that is a moral culture. If you don't have a healthy moral culture, you can't hire enough police people, right? Uh, the rule of law only exists when a culture can agree on its moral bearings, at least to some, to some extent. And so that, that's something I thought I could contribute to. And that's what this book is about. Now, I'm, going, I'm not going to try to rehearse the whole book, tempting as that is, because I, I hear there's something else going on tonight. Um, and pretty, and I'm fairly certain the Wildcats will win tonight, <laughs> one way or the other. Um, and there will be happy people and sad people. But, so I can't do it all, but I do want to do a few things. Uh, I just want to start with two texts. The first one from the, from the Bible. The first one is the 22nd chapter of Exodus, which is uh, part of a, a, a group of laws uh, usually called the Covenant Code. It's a, it's a set of laws about all sorts of topics which are then expanded upon, modified, developed, uh, commented on in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So it's a sort of short version of what comes later. And we have a law in Leviticus 22, in Exodus 22, uh, verse 21. Uh, you should not oppress the ger. The Hebrew word is ger, which sometimes gets translated as stranger, but I think it's really better translated as migrant. The migrant. You will not oppress the migrant or mistreat him because you were migrants in the land of Egypt. Uh, you should not mistreat, you should also not mistreat any widows or orphans. So you notice that triad, the migrants, the widows, the orphans. The abuse of the migrant is as contemptible as the abuse of orphans and widows. And then something, the next line, which is really atypical of the Bible, but it goes like this. If you, if you, do, if you do oppress that person, when they cry out to me, I will certainly listen to their cry. And you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, that, that sounds like the story of the Exodus. And we just talked about you were, you, were, you were migrants in Egypt and I will listen to their cry. Why? Because the God of the Bible is in the habit of listening to the cries of migrants. And their story is in some way parallel to your story and your story is one that is one of liberation and therefore you should live in a world of empathy, em empathizing with those who experience the same kinds of things you experience. We might say you and I follow a living, a dying Lord. We follow a Lord who was crucified and in our baptisms we became obedient to his death, which does not mean simply that we accepted the benefits of his death, right? But that we signed on in some ways to be vulnerable also to that sort of death. It's the culture of empathy. And then the text goes on in Exodus 
in a way that's very unusual, actually. Uh, people think the laws of the Old Testament always end with threats, but actually that's quite rare. Uh, and the threats usually have to do with idolatry, things that only God can straighten out. But here it goes. If you do those things and they cry out to me and I will listen to their cry and my anger will burn and I will kill you by the sword and your wives will be widows and your children will be orphans. Now, I'm, uh, I, I like biblical exegesis of really obscure texts, but I don't think this is one of those actually. Uh, the, the text ends with this very clear threat of divine retribution on those who abuse the alien. Now, that's one text, and I want to go to another one that's much happier, uh, and that's in the Gospel according to Matthew. I say much happier because the Old Testament's all about gloom and doom, and the New Testament's all about joy and in the morning, right? That was an Old Testament professor's joke, so it ain't so, right? Matthew 25 is the story Jesus tells of the great assize, the last judgment. He says, the judge, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will judge the world and he will divide the world. And there will be some people that he says to them, welcome into the, my kingdom. Because when I was, and then, you know, come in and enjoy things. And he says, because when I was hungry, you fed me, and when I was naked, you clothed me, and when I was in prison, you visited me, and when I was sick, you helped me get well. And, and when I was a xenos, a stranger, an alien, a non-citizen, you welcomed me. And these people, being utterly righteous, say to the, to the great judge, sir, excuse me, but we don't, we don't remember doing that. Now, only really righteous people would do that, frankly, and I, I say this to myself, this is a free bit of New Testament exegesis. That is not what I intend to say on the day of judgment. My intention, if I hear those words, is to be absolutely silent in hopes that there hasn't been a mistake made. But the righteous respond by saying, when did we do it? And he says, whenever you did it to one of these, the least of these, my brothers which means that some of the early Christians, at the very least, were among those who were hungry and naked and sick and in prison and migrants. And then he turns to the other group and, they, and he says to them, sorry, you're not in. And, and the reason is because they didn't do those things. I was a migrant and you did not visit me. And they say, but Lord, Lord, excuse me, Lord, uh, we did many marvelous things in your name. We did miracles. We cast out demons. We gave lectures at Christian colleges. We did all kinds of marvelous things. And he says, well, I'm sorry. I didn't, I don't know who, I didn't ask you to do any of those things. I don't know who you are. I told you it was a happier text. Now, between those two texts, you think, well, wait a minute. So, Mark, what you're, say what you're saying several things. It's not just a threat. I'm not, you know, the Bible is not mostly a book of laws, and it's not mostly, certainly not a book of threats for the most part. It's a book of story and song and visions of the future and all of that. Uh, but it does, have, it does have some threats in there because there are stories about the righteousness of God, the God who created all human beings, and who called all human beings to be his servants and called all human beings to treat all the other human beings as well as they could. So, what does it mean? Now, that's just a page or two in the book, actually. The rest of the book kind of traces how we get from one of those things to the other. Uh, what you find is, in reading the Bible, uh, the idea of the stranger, the migrant, the ger in Hebrew, the xenos, the paroikos, we'll throw out a bunch of Greek words in the, in the, in the New Testament. The, that, that topic is not an obscure topic in the Bible. It shows up over and over again. Do not abuse the, the stranger is in fact the most common law in biblical law. It's the most repeated law of all. 
It's not some minor topic tucked away. Nor does the Bible, uh, you know, all, nor does the Bible speak with several voices. I mean, often the Bible on a, a given topic can say different things, like kingship, for example. Some texts really think kingship's wonderful, not very many of them. Lots of texts think kingship's pretty horrible, a larger number. Most texts think, well, there are pluses and minuses. And on the whole, we'd rather do without it. But if we're stuck with it, let's see if we can manage it. It's not univocal. There's not just one idea. There are many ideas. On this one, it's more univocal, honestly. Which is why, for me, it's surprising and discouraging to hear the church being often so unclear on this and allowing our prejudices, our fears, to get in the way of the gospel. It's not about which party you voted for or which political view you have, although it may be, it does touch on that at some point. Uh, and there's enough blame to go around on that score. It's deeper than that. It's about our own lives as Christians. The prophets, for example, make it very clear that if our worship is absolutely spot on, and we mistreat those around us, not only does it not count, but it offends the Almighty. It's something that makes him, well, it ticks him off, actually. And why shouldn't it? Because why would the good Lord, who has extended enormous grace and mercy to us, want to hang around with human beings who can't do it to each other? Now. More than that, before I just start preaching, uh, which I've never been known to do, I, I would say if you, if you look at all this parade of texts, and there are a bunch of them in the Bible, they tend to fall into two big categories, I think. One, one set of texts are about what it means to host the migrant. So you have laws like the ones I just read in Matthew and in Exodus and a lot of other places. Uh, and you have stories about hosting the migrant, at least on a few occasions. You have more, more texts, though, about being the migrant. And in fact, if you think about the Bible, the three-fourths of the Bible that make up the Old Testament, there really are two huge stories that operate through the whole text that appear over and over and over again. Those two stories are the story of the Exodus, which is about the deliverance of migrants from bondage. They came to Egypt as 70 or 72 people, depending on which manuscript tradition you follow, doesn't matter. And they, they came and they left a great nation. But in the middle, they were abused and oppressed, so much so that their cries came up to God. Uh, and the other great Tech, the other great story in the Old Testament is the story of, um, of the exile, uh, Exodus and exile, which is a story about migrants who move from their land and then return to it, were at times abused and at other times resilient. Those are the two, those big ideas operate through the, the, the Old Testament, the host and the one hosted. And not just the Old Testament, of course, for those of you who know the New Testament extremely well, which is probably almost everybody in the room, if you think about it a while, you quickly realize that theme appears over and over and over again. James to the 12 tribes in diaspora, right? Peter to the, and it just goes on. Uh, don't forget to entertain strangers, which doesn't mean somebody from your neck of the woods, but somebody from further away than your neck of the woods, somebody who's new to town, because some have what? Entertain angels without knowing it. It's a very strange rationale if you think about it. I should be nice just in case they might be angels. Honestly, I've never suspected anyone I knew of being an angel. I have suspected them of other supernatural identities, but, but that's not an angel. But then again, sometimes they're very cleverly disguised. 
And then again, maybe there are people for whom God intends that sort of eternal destiny. Don't forget to entertain them. What we see in that discussion, the host and the hosted, is the attempt of the Bible to build a culture of empathy. Now, you sometimes hear people say, well, look, they broke the law, didn't they? Uh, They broke the law, that's enough to justify what happens to them. It is rather like the argument I used to make when I was eight years old, uh, that my brother should be spanked because the cookies we'd been instructed not to eat, he had in fact eaten. I, I, did, I do entertain the possibility that he also made the same argument in reverse. But in other words, the argument is morally childish. Uh, it is the kind of literal thinking one would expect and, in, and rightly expect of small children. It is a trivial argument and very different from the argument the Bible itself makes in which there is great moral clarity about the nature of human beings, about those who are welcome to the table of the Lord and with whom we share the deepest possible identity, deeper than the name on our passport, uh, and about those who are not yet at the table of the Lord, but whose identity we share as fellow human beings. It is true indeed, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, that, that much, of our, much of our discussion reflects modern realities. Uh, the idea that you are a citizen of one state and one, only one state goes back to about 1648, so-called Westphalian system which is a long time ago in American history, but in most of the rest of the world is, well, the day before yesterday. And and in in fact, it's evolved over time. When my ancestors, the Hamiltons, came from Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland, I doubt anybody checked their papers uh, because if they had, they wouldn't have let them in. And I'd be eating haggis right now, probably. That's the only joke I'd planned for tonight, so there it is. <laughs> but, you know, that's the reality. This, we're, the discussion we're having is a modern discussion in all sorts of ways, and yet there are different realities we should point to. I, I want to I go about two more minutes, which in Mark speak means eight more minutes. <laughs> but I, I just want to end with a couple of readings from the book. One is actually from the Gospels. Um, in, in Matthew and Luke, there are two, two versions of a story uh, that about, a, um, about Jesus' encounter with a centurion. The story is interesting because it goes like this. Well, there are two, as I say, there are two slightly different versions. Well, I'll just read the one from Luke. When he had finished his words so the people could hear, he went to Capernaum. A certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was ill and at death's door. Now remember the centurion is is an officer in the Roman army and presumably not Jewish. Upon hearing about Jesus, it wouldn't make sense in the story if he were Jewish. I mean, there were Jewish soldiers, but I don't think he was. Upon hearing about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him to ask him to save his servant. They encouraged Jesus to come quickly and they told him, he deserves for you to do this. For he loves our people and built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with him. When he was not far off, the centurion sent some friends to say, sir, don't bother. I don't deserve for you to come under my roof. I'm not important enough for you to come. But speak the word and my servant will be healed. Now I'm a man who follows orders and has soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard these things, he was astonished. And he turned to the crowd following him. He said, I tell you, I haven't found such faith in Israel. When the messengers returned to the house, they found the slave healed. The story's interesting, I think, for a lot of reasons, because it, it exists at that, at that binding point of the text that talk about Israel as the host of the foreigner 
and Israel as the foreigner. The centurion was in a sense being hosted by these people, but hosted has to be in quotation marks because it was a hosting without permission, right? Palestine is an occupied area. It's part of the Roman Empire. And, and in fact, uh, a large contingent of soldiers are kept there. One, it's on the border, an important and somewhat troubled border. And two, the locals aren't that happy to see Rome there. So the centurion is himself a kind of border crosser, right? He is uh, the sort of person who could easily not fit in very well. He makes a connection to the people by paying for their synagogue, by being part of their community, by following some of the norms of their community. And they, of course, welcome him. And they say to Jesus, well, he deserves your help. What's interesting to me, though, is that that last exchange where he says, don't, don't, you don't need to come. He, he does it two sides. He says modestly, you know, I'm not that big a deal. Just do, I, I trust you. Do what you need to do. And I, I believe it'll happen. On the other hand, I, you know, I really am somebody you can take seriously because I, uh, I'm an important person. Jesus, I'm not nothing, but I trust you to do what needs to be done. I think that that double-sidedness of his presentation is interesting. Sometimes, and there are a lot of things to say, and I didn't actually say this in the book, but I'll say it now. Sometimes those of us who are the host act as though the ones who are amongst us are not somebody. We rewrite their history. How many times have you seen it happen when a person in Abilene has a name that the people aren't familiar with and they say, could I call you something else? It's a small thing. It's an incredibly offensive thing. I say this as one white person to other white people. St stop. <laughs> stop doing that. It's very offensive. You can learn two or three syllables. It's okay. And if we mess up, that's okay too. Now, I'm lucky. My name is Mark. It's kind of hard to mess that up. Though I was in middle school. You're there always. <laughs> but it's a question of respect, right? It's a question of respect. Um, People have histories. Do we see somebody who's just a charity case? Or do we see somebody, which is better than seeing an enemy, that's an improvement. Or do we see a fellow child of God with whom we can be a friend and a partner in the gospel? And then I'll conclude this way. Uh, the, first, the first paragraph opens the book with the idea of movement. Human movement is the one thing that has been constant throughout our history. In fact, in scripture, uh, it's valued. The attempts by human beings all to stay in one place meets with, well, it's the Tower of Babel story. You gotta get moving. But I wanna read the last paragraph of the book, if I may, and then I'll stop. So movement, movement. Along with climate and terrain, the need for food and water and shelter, movement contains one of the constants of human existence. None of us stand still for long. For some, migration crosses space and time and involves the body. For the rest, the longest trip may take place in the human mind as we learn to think more broadly. Scripture gives us, as I've tried to argue, a map of both journeys and their numerous points of contact. Whether the church, whether I, whether you, whether the church takes that journey remains a question. My prayer is that we will answer that question in the affirmative and take that journey together. Thank you for listening this evening. <laughs>